David Wallstein is providing headlines just about every day in the Bridgegate trial. Wallstein, if you may remember, he is the former Port Authority official who pleaded guilty and is now cooperating as the prosecution's star witness. Now, last week, he said Governor Chris Christie is lying and that the governor knew about the whole scheme to close the lanes while they were shut down. This week, Wildstein said Christie and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signed off on the cover story that the lanes were closed for a traffic study. Christie and Cuomo, for their parts, are denying all of it. Now, the defense attorneys for Bill Baroni and Bridget Kelly, those are the folks actually on trial, say Wildstein has no credibility and has been lying. I want to bring in our legal panel here to weigh in. we got Jim Kasouris. He's a criminal defense attorney in Manhattan. He sits on the board of directors of the New York City Criminal Bar Association, frequently lecturing at the New York Law School and the Bar Associations in Queens and New York City. Doug Von Ois, who just hit him on the arm as I was introducing him, is a founding <laughs> partner of Carson Von Ois, focusing on corporate misconduct, selected by the Legal 500 as one of the most influential trial lawyers in the country. And Mayo Bartlett is an attorney at the law offices of Mayo Bartlett PLC and former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office and is involved in some of the more high-profile civil rights cases you're going to see. All right, guys, and I'll start, as I usually do on my left here, and work my way around. Um, is it just, you're sitting in the jury box. Prosecution lays out in their opening statements. We are not alleging, we are going to prove that the governor knew what was going on. But by the way, we're not charging him with anything. We got, you know, we got Baroni and we got uh, Bridget Kelly that uh, we're, br we're bringing a case against. Now today, Wildstein, who might as well set up camp there, has been there for so long. Amazing. You're right. Amazing. Says that not only did Christie know during the bridge closures, not just after it, not only did he lie through his teeth, according to Mr. Wildstein, um, when he told everyone that this was just a study, he didn't know anything about it. He claims he knew about it on 9-11, uh, during a ceremony, um, and they showed a still photo, and they said that's him laughing when we told him what we were doing. But now he says the governor was in cahoots, not during the closures, but after it became a story that the governor basically said, let's make this thing go away. I'll have the guys at the Port Authority basically back off you with all these questions. What does he have to lie, advantage to lie about this? But on the flip side, if you're a juror, do you say, I don't know how much of this I'm going to believe? Well, it, from a perception of a juror, you think about it, you've got the two least senior participants here who are on trial, and you have the government saying, we're going to prove the guilt of Governor Christie to you during the trial. And now you have Wildstein saying, oh, and by the way, Governor Cuomo was also involved. Now, I don't know if he said Governor Cuomo knew it was false or that he just signed off on the excuse, but the jury's got to be thinking, how can I believe this guy if he's their only proof and they obviously don't believe him enough to indict these huge players? Mm -hmm. And so from uh, uh, the, just the optics of it, and I'm sure the defense attorneys are going to focus on this in their summations, but if the government says they're going to prove it and the proof they put up is a cooperating witness who has everything to gain by making it as, mo as much a spectacular story as he can, why should we believe him if the government doesn't believe him enough to indict these people? Because we all know that the prosecutor wants the biggest mm. headline that it can get. But Doug, again, you're a former prosecutor and everybody knows the feds after this amount of time wouldn't have brought the case and wouldn't have made as grand a proclamation in their opening statements, one would think at least, with the world watching unless they thought they were going to be able to prove their case. So if their star witness is saying this, and this is what, day 70 is on the stand, right? Um, Can't imagine what they're asking for seven uh, days. But again, from my point, I would think the feds aren't throwing a Hail Mary with, you know, that Wildstein... Basically, what's your story today? There's got to be more to it. So it begs for me the question, if you're counsel for Bridget Kelly, you're counsel for Baroni, are you nervous now from what you're hearing? Are you saying, well, maybe I can strike a deal with the feds after what I've heard from Wildstein and where they're going? Or are you more confident than when the trial started that if this is the best card they're going to play, I'm not sweating bullets? Well, it sounds like it's pretty late to be striking deals at Ship this point. Ship has sailed. I mean, I think that they're well into trial. If you look at, I don't think these people were probably the, the uh, targets of this investigation originally. It probably was the go governor. 
and now they're kind of stuck with what they got. And if you think about it really logically, to say that the Governor Cuomo was in on it and Christie knew it, that's the only thing that would make sense. Because now you have Governor Christie on one side and you have Cuomo on the other. Even if Christie knew about it, on some, somebody would ask, they're doing all this and New York didn't know? So really the process. And, and the specific allegation for the folks who, who don't know, because I do know this gets complicated, is the allegation isn't that Christie, per Wadstein, called Cuomo and said, hey, we're going to shut down the bridge here. You watch this. It's after the bridge was shut down for multiple days. The Port Authority, and we know this on the New York side, said, what's going on here? This is crazy. Why is this shut down? And then when the questions grew louder and louder, all of a sudden, they said, all right, we got to better end this. The allegation, per David Waldstein, is that a conversation took place after the lanes were reopened between Governor Christie to Governor Cuomo to say, hey, I, you don't want to know all the stuff that went on over here, here, but basically we're going to tell everybody it was a traffic study. Can you, get, can you call up the dogs, the New York Port Authority, to get off my back here? i got to handle press conferences and everything else. And as a professional courtesy or whatever else, the allegation follows that, that Governor Cuomo says, all right, I'll tell my guys to, to get off, and you give whatever cockamamie story you want, but leave me out of it. Right. So, so you, now you have what you just said exactly is what a defense attorney would have said in closing if they didn't bring this out. They would have said they did all this and, they, and the governor of New York didn't know about it. So it sounds like it's stretching, and maybe it is, but he's really the prosecutor's trying to fill in logical holes in the story. You know, Mayor, uh, a friend to us on this show, Bill Aaron Wald, you know well, he's always said, even if Christie knew, where's the crime? Not the, not the ethical lapses um, and, and potentially even fatal um, consequences that could have come out of shutting lanes for political spite here. Um, but where's the crime, especially with the McConnell case that we've talked about out of Virginia and having to prove the quid pro quo and everything else? Is that the reason why Christie's not charged if the prosecution said he knew about it? Well, I tend to think or that they, they couldn't prove it. Well, it depends on what you're looking at Christie for. Christie could possibly be involved in the conspiracy if he's aware of it, and he is the chief executive officer in the state of New Jersey. Uh, he's impacting people not just in New York and New Jersey, but you're looking at even an even interstate. Even if he found out during the fact, not before, wasn't involved in the plotting of it. His obligation during the fact is to stop it. He represents the people of New Jersey, and he represents every other person who travels through New York and New Jersey. I agree with you, the idiocy of it and the wrongness of it, but is it criminal? Well, it could also be criminal. It depends on whether he, uh, what he said to federal agents and whether he's made that statement. And if you're making a false statement to a federal agent, it doesn't have to be sworn. Unlike in Congress, where maybe you get granted special immunity to yep. give unsworn testimony before Congress. Uh, if you're talking to a federal agent and you give them materially false information or information that they construe to be false, that's enough for them to mm -hmm. charge you. And then you have to go and basically defend that. If you choose yep. to go to trial, you can't. And remember, uh, conspiracy is a continuing crime. You don't have to join in the beginning. You can join at any time during the commission of a conspiracy. It's a continuing crime. Okay. You guys have been on both sides of this. Um, so my question is, when there is a cooperating witness, somebody who pleaded out to get a deal so he or she doesn't see the inside of a cell, as a prosecutor and also as a defense attorney, does it matter how the guy comes across, regardless of his testimony, if he looks like a weasel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How much of that factors into it? And do you find, by and large, the juries are predisposed to say, hey, if he's putting his hand up, I'm going to believe what he says here, unless somebody proves otherwise, or this guy's saving his bacon here. He better have a great story because I'm already predisposed not to believe him. What have you guys found? The art of cross-examination involves not only the substance, where you want to attack his story for its credibility and you try to come up with ways to discredit his testimony, but there is no question that one's appearance, one's demeanor on the stand is equally as important. And the art of cross-examination is to find a way under that person's skin to bring out that mm -hmm. devious, deceptive nature that he or she has or just to get under their skin so that optically yeah. They don't look credible. So you lick your chops when somebody's uh, already pleaded something out to get a, a, a deal to, to save his or her hide here, and then you get to cross it. Well, lots of times these people also denied things in the beginning. So quite often they said, oh, I have nothing to do with this. I don't know what you're talking about. Now all of a sudden they're the witness saying that two governors are involved and all of that. So 
as a defense attorney, I would love to say, well, look, are you lying now or were you lying then? Let a jury mm -hmm. figure out what, and, and at this point, you have every interest in giving the prosecution exactly what they're looking for because you want them to write a letter for leniency for you down the road to the judge. Well, the allegations of corruption, uh, I'm never at a loss for uh, options to cover here, including uh, going back across the GW Bridge, not to Albany, but to New York City this time, in the latest ethics investigation of Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration. Times reporting that de Blasio's political nonprofit organization called Campaign for One New York it has been served with a sweeping subpoena. Paper says it's seeking all communication between the mayor, his aides, and that organization. State panel, which enforces state ethics laws, appears to be widening its probe into lobbying activities. Times points out that this probe is separate from about a half dozen other federal and state criminal investigations that are ongoing into the mayor's fundraising activities. Um, Explain, Doug, when you hear wide-ranging subpoena to get a hold of all communications, is that the kind of thing that makes uh, a political office especially nervous? Because they could, they could find stuff they weren't even looking for. Well, that's the whole point. If, if When they go in with one purpose and they're looking at everything, they could come out with something else. So whenever you hear wide-ranging, it makes everybody nervous. I mean, it's an investigation of anything. It's usually not the actual act that the person gets in trouble for. It's some, something else that flowed but I from I always it. thought judges made it narrow cast, what the subpoena could be allowed for. Why make it such a big umbrella that they can go on a fishing expedition? Well, they fought it in this case. They asked for the uh, subpoena to be quashed, and then they asked for it to be narrowed, and the judge considered it and said, no, I think that these things are all relevant, and, and they could be uh, discoverable information that could be turned over. i tell you one thing I've learned the last couple of years, guys. Do not... Run for office. Key off <laughs> the, uh, the U.S. attorney, man. I mean, it's, true. it's the power. You guys have been saying this for forever, and I, sometimes I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's true. The feds and the U.S. attorney, federal prosecutors, if they want, they're going to keep looking and keep looking until they, they, until they get to the bottom well, of something. They've got the time. They've got the money. They've got the agents. And once they have the desire... <laughs> Quite out often, of their way. It's, it's no different than that show Billions, and you look at it, and sometimes you hope it doesn't become personal, but it could. And you look at some of the cases that get prosecuted and some that don't. For instance, again, there's nothing being brought against anybody involved in Wells Fargo, but you have people with very minor transgressions where if it was brought in state court, it would re resolve itself without even a criminal conviction. Interesting. All right, guys, thank you. Now, when we come back, we're going to go back to New Jersey, but uh, this has a little bit to do with politics, but also about what the expectations of the public should be. I'm talking about that tragic uh, train accident that happened with New Jersey Transit. And again here, the more we learn, the more questions I certainly have as to what the authority was thinking and also those that are supposed to be in charge of it. We'll talk about that and some of the legal exposure now that might be happening.